Uh, I'm excited about giving this class. I was a little nervous because we're talking about taking 129 conferences and sort of diluting it into three hours. And like I said, this is an introduction to the theology of the body. Now, just on a show of hands, how many have taken any sort of class or read anything about theology of the body? Okay, so about two of you. Okay, actually, this is great because a lot of you never, have you ever heard of this concept before? Okay, uh, some of you have heard it before, but maybe you've never sat down and just dove into it a little bit. So first off, let me just explain what the theology of the body is and what we're going to talk about today is called original man. Okay, uh, Theology of the body was a series of, of catechesis, of classes, that John Paul II gave to the church. Um, and they were during what's called his Wednesday audiences. So if you've ever been to, I know some of you in this room have been to, with me to at, in Italy, and one of the highlights is when you go to Italy or Rome, uh, you do what's called, you go and visit the Vatican, and the Pope comes out outside and he gives a class to anyone who shows up. You have to get tickets, but it's, it's thousands of people, and uh, they're called the general audiences. And so for, from pretty much from... Um, from September 5th, 1979 to November 28th, 1984, he gave all these classes, 129 classes on basically human love and, and, and human sexuality and just using a new teaching about how to, to teach on difficult topics in a more positive way. Okay, because a lot of times, yeah, and so that's what it is. It's a series of, of, of catechesis that he gave. And I think we're just beginning to really understand at a deeper level, and it's actually helping us preach these topics in a more powerful way. And uh, now, uh, some terms that you're gonna need to know, and then uh, is first is, it's what, and these come from him, but also it's, I'm sure that other saints have mentioned this, but he talks about there's a nuptial meaning of the body. Okay, nuptial, you know, that's always related to marriage, but there's something that the body in itself teaches us about us as human persons. So that's one thing you'll hear a lot is this nuptial meaning of the body. And his purpose uh, is to show us a true vision of man, a true vision of man, and also answer questions like, who are we? Why did God create us male and female, right? Which today is being <laughs> very much, uh, people are up against that today, as we see in, in the public square. How are we to live and what is our destiny? And, um, and I think it's very important to maybe to know these things, especially to look at these conferences, because I think they're rather prophetic because after he died, we've had a lot of things happen in society. Uh, the legalization of homosexual marriage. We've also seen a lot of this, a lot of talk of gender confusion and trying to, you know, where, you know, men can say they're women and go into certain bathrooms and all this kind of confusion. And well, what is, what is what, where, what's the truth of the matter and how do we talk to people about this in a way that uh, helps them to understand what does the body tell us? And is it something that's fluid or is it something uh, much deeper than that? And then John Paul would say that the body is very precious and it's, and it's a temple of the Holy Spirit, but the, uh, relationships tell us a lot about who we are and so does the human body. Now, um, sort of a quick overview of what we're gonna go in these three classes. And today we're going to talk about, we're basically it's three parts. First is what's called original man. And what that means is, what were we like before sin entered the world? And another, another, another thing we're going to investigate is, what does the book of Genesis tell us about us as human persons? Now the word gen, the, you know, Genesis is the first book of the Bible, but it also means what? The beginning. The word Genesis means the beginning. And what, what, you know, a lot of times people say, well, that's just normal to think that, you ever heard that, like, well, that's just, you know, you know, boys are with boys, that's just normal. And was that really the human, how a human person should be? Or were we, were we like that in the beginning? And we're gonna see that we weren't always off, so to speak, that God made us, everything he made was what? Was good. And he's gonna, we're gonna have this vision of what we would, we would be like if Adam and Eve never sinned. Okay, and it's very beautiful because it teaches us a lot about, once again, the human body and human love and also uh, human sexuality. And then we're gonna go into what's called historical man, the next class. And that is gonna sort of talk about what happened from the time Adam and Eve sinned to the current day. And the battles that we have 
and trying and and we've kind of lost that pure vision that Adam and Eve had. But the good news is, is we're not sort of destined to be always trapped into that mindset because Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose from the dead to restore us back to to innocence, to give us a, a, a way of loving that could not be done if he had not died for us. But the reality is, is and we'll talk about this in the next class, in historical man, is we struggle with what's called concupiscence. All right? This is a strong inclination to sin, and in that is also the struggle with uh, sort of a skewed view of human sexuality and shame that people can have in their lives, and the Lord wants to heal that. But the, the reality is, is we lost that vision we had at the beginning. And then we're going to talk about eschatological man, right? Now, a lot of you came to my class on the five signs of the lack of, of, of that Jesus is going to come, right? And I taught you that word eschatology, right? And what is eschatology? Eschatology is the last things. And so essentially, what will we be like, you know, in the next world? Will we have bodies? And and also through God's grace, you know, um, is, I mean, are there, you know, is there marriage in heaven and all these other kind of things? Like, what are we going to be like? You know, and we're going to look at this. We're going to investigate it. But also we're going to tie it in with, with um, celibacy. You know, like a lot of times people attack celibacy. Say, oh, that's crazy. Why, you know, why don't you get married, Father? And, but you remember that celibacy is a foretaste of what we're all going to be like in heaven. But it's going to be a very powerful thing. It's just a foretaste of what we're all going to participate in heaven. So kind of reviewing. We're today talk about original man, then next class, historical man, and then the last class will be eschatological man. Okay? Do you have a headache yet? Okay. All right. Good. And I just, I mean, like, like I said, this is a lot. I mean, if you read Theology of the Body, it, it's very, very difficult to read. Uh, I would suggest there's a couple, um, I will email you or I'll be email a thought note a couple resources to read on your own, commentaries on Theology of the Body, uh, and some videos you can watch. Okay? All right. So that being said, let's kind of dive into the Theology of the Body and look at original man. Now, um, <clears throat> It really starts this these whole these conferences. Not that it, it originally started, but sort of the uh, John Paul uses Matthew 19 as a launch pad for theology of the body and to speak about the original man. And I ask you to turn to Matthew 19 if you have your Bibles, and uh, I will I will um, I will read this slowly, and then we're going to unpack this. And so it says in Matthew chapter 19 verse three. Some Pharisees approached him and tested him, saying, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any cause whatever? He said in reply, Have you not read that from the beginning the Creator made them male and female? And said, For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, no human being must separate. They said to him, Then why did Moses command that the man be given a woman a bill of divorce and dismiss her? And he said to them, Because of the hardness of your hearts, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. Now notice, what are the, what's the key words to that passage that we're going to focus on? The beginning and it was not so. So, now he, um, so let's, let's kind of look at this, this and step back. As our Lord is teaching us, God, Jesus is God. Jesus was there at creation, helped with creation. He's part, he's the second person of the Blessed Trinity. Uh, our Lord knows the human person because he made us. And he basically says, in the beginning, in the book of Genesis, when Adam and Eve were first made, there was no such thing as lust. There was no such thing as hatred. There was no such thing as domination. There was nothing ugly in the human person. In the beginning, there would never have been what? Divorce. Because man and woman loved themselves perfectly. In the image and likeness of God, they loved each other. And they were able to love in a dimension that God loves us. Okay, so let's go back to the beginning. Now, what we're going to dive into here is three parts of this first part is we're going to look at original, what we call original solitude. It's a term you must know with theology of the body. Like Adam, before the woman came, what does that teach us about mankind? 
Number two, we're going to talk about original unity, where the, the two became one flesh. And then uh, John Paul talks about original nakedness. <laughs> I know, he's like, oh, everyone starts. And once, it, once again, it, it's, it sounds awkward because, once again, most people, they think, oh my gosh, what are we talking about here? But in the beginning, it was not so, right? And it, it could talk a little bit about the human person. What did that mean? Why were they naked without shame? It says in the Bible. All right, so let's start off with original solitude. Now, in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, um, in the second creation account, remember there's two creation accounts. Genesis 1 is one creation account, and Genesis 2 is another creation account. And, and they're, they're, both of them teach us different messages. The same, same story, but it's said in a different way, right? Do you know that? There's two creation accounts. Okay, it's all right, now you know. <laughs> so Genesis 1 is one, Genesis 2 is another. Now we're looking at the second creation account. And if you turn, if you look at, if you turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 2, uh, uh, verse uh, 18, uh, so God, uh, it says that, it says basically, so I'm just going to read the one uh, quote that we're going to focus on, where God says, it is not good for man to be alone. All right? And, um, and it says that, you know, he uh, had him, uh, name the animals to, and to, he had to find a, a suitable helpmate, right? And so we see that that Adam is alone. What does that mean? And why was it not good for him alone? Is what does that teach us about the human person? Now, one, the one thing I want you to where it says man, the Hebrew word for man is actually Adam. Okay. Now, the, in this in this particular text, the word Adam. Uh, does not mean necessarily male, but it means mankind, like the human person. The word Adam for man does not mean just male, but it means mankind was not supposed to be what? Alone. And, um, and we see in this, in this creation account that Adam is given the job to name the animals, which shows he has dominion over them, and Adam goes through this process where he's, he's sort of naming the animals, and but he, the one problem he had with the, the animals is he could not relate to them. And uh, John Paul II, in his Theology of the Body, he says this. I'll read it slowly. Let's unpack it. He says, by means of this test, man, remember Adam, are you with me? Man, man becomes aware of his own superiority. Now, did you get that? We're more superior than a dog, right? Are more superior than animals. Uh, you know, we are greater than the animals, right? We're different than the animals, all right? And that is that he cannot be considered on the same footing as any other species of living beings on the earth. And so in this original test where he's naming the animals, um, and it says in the text in Genesis 2.19, whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name, Okay. And the man gave names to all the cattle, to the birds of the air, to every beast of the field. But for the man, there was found no helper fit for him. Did you read that? So there was no helper that was fit for him, that he could what? Be in communion with. Right? Now, I mean, I don't want to go into this whole debate about, you know, do your dogs love you? You know, this always turns into like, you know, you kicked out of grade school teaching after you, you break that to the students. But but the love between a person, person to person, is real love. It's not instinctual. And, it, and the other thing is, what's the difference between a man, us, and the animal kingdom is we have rational souls. Okay, we have rational souls. We actually can step back and we can think about our being. We think about why we do things. We analyze things. We choose to love people, we choose not to love people. We have free will. We are superior to the animals, right? And so we are, and also we have what's called an immortal soul. We have a rational soul, okay? Animals do have a soul, but they don't have a rational soul. And when they die, they die. Our souls are immortal, they go on forever. But we have this, uh, we have this, 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 this soul. So. Adam was alone in the most profound sense because there was no other creature in whom he could pour out his love and receive love in return. Adam's innate longing for love left 
an echo that still resounds in every human heart. Animals, do they do not reflect on questions like, who am I, where am I going, what's my ultimate destiny, what is the meaning of life? Animals don't do this. They don't even think about what they're going to eat that day. You just put it in front of them. But we as human pe persons, we have this sense of what's called, a John Paul calls, self-actualization. That we can know who we are and we can find out who we are. And, and also, we have this capacity to love and to what? To be loved. And what's the hunger that's in every human part that if you don't receive this, you get a little crazy? If you don't feel what? Love. Loved. But then the question is, what is love? In the truest sense of the word. How does man love, really love, a woman? And how does he maybe not love? All right, so that's the first thing, is that we see in this, this original solitude is that Adam, mankind, Adam, is different than the animals. We're not just base instincts. That's what makes us human. We actually can make decisions. And more importantly, we can, we can love in a very pure way. John Paul II, he says in this conference, he says this, man alone is because he is, quote, different from the visible world, from the world of living beings, uh, witnesses how man distinguished himself before God from the whole world of living beings with his first act of self-consciousness and how he reveals himself to himself. So what that means is Adam, by naming the animals, realized, wait a minute, I am completely different than animals. There's something special about me. Right? And he fell alone. Now, God even says, it's a document of Vatican II, it says this, and I think everyone should write this down. It's a good thing to kind of pray over it. Guardian says number 24. It says this. Man is the only creature on earth which God willed for itself, and he cannot fully find himself except through a sincere gift of himself. Now, I want to ask like people that are married. Did you change when you got married? Like maybe and think about this. Like when you really, when you, if you, if you fell in love and you got married, did something? Did you feel more complete when you got married than when you were alone? I just want you to. I want you to kind of. I mean, I want you to really focus on it. it was there something that you felt more complete? You know, in that step when you gave yourself to another human person and opened yourself vulnerably to them, and gave yourself to them. There's something right about that, right? And, and so that's where we're getting with the theology of the body, is that we were made as human persons to be a communion of persons. Now that's another phrase that John Paul uses a lot, communion of persons. All right, now, what else does the body tell us? I mean, and now we're going to get this original unity. I don't want to jump jump ahead too much. But here it is. How important it is to live our sexuality in a way which upholds and affirms the other person? Now, I think the key is this. John Paul makes this distinction. He says, love, the opposite of love, is to use another person. All right, that's a theme in his theology of the body. The opposite of love is to use another person. When you're in love, true love, you give yourself to that person totally, and you receive them totally. Not just a part of them, but their whole what? The whole person. The whole personhood. Right? And I think what's happened, unfortunately, in, in our society is we've objectified the human person. All right, and a lot of people do not experience a communion of persons. But so right now, we're, we're uh, let's go back to original unity. What happens? So we we see here something has to happen. God has to make sure that Adam's not what alone. And so what does he do? He makes who Eve, the first woman. All right, now let's let's go. Let's look at let's look at Genesis chapter two and the creation account 
and see what it tells about man, woman, and sexuality. And so in, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 21, it says, so the, now we're getting what's called original unity. So the first step was we talked about original solitude, right? And what we see is that, uh, that the, we know, we know that we were made to be loved and to love others, but other persons, okay? Not things, but persons. All right, and so God had to make the suitable helpmate, and the suitable helpmate for man was equal to the man, but also what? Different. What's being challenged today? Co uh, complementarity or distinction. Men and women complement each other, right? They're different than each other, but men and women also, our church teaches, the Bible teaches that men and women are what? are equal in dignity, equal. They both bring different gifts to the table, but they're equal, but they're also different. Now, brothers and sisters, think about this. What does that tell us when, when God says in Genesis chapter 1, let us make man in our image and likeness, what do we know about the Blessed Trinity? We have three distinct persons that make one, one God. And so what, our, what the Holy Father is saying, John Paul II, now St. John Paul II is saying, is that man and woman together are more in the image and likeness than they are alone. That a man and woman together image more the Trinity than just a person alone. <clears throat> Let us make man in what? Our image and likeness. Do you see that? That's a huge theological point there. And so it goes on to says, So the Lord God cast a deep sleep in the man, verse 21, chapter 2. And while he was asleep, he took out one of his ribs and closed it in place with flesh. The Lord then built the rib that he had taken from the man into a woman. And he, when he brought her to the man, the man said, Bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. All right, let's unpack that. All right, there's a lot there. All right, first off, let's look at the rib. All right, the rib. Now, John Paul II, uh, he speaks about this in Theology of the Body, uh, Session 8, uh, Part 4. He makes the point that the creation from the rib is, quote, archaic, metaphorical, in a figurative way of expression, homogene homogeneity, which is basically of the same substance. Okay, so when you take from the side of a person, John Paul makes a, you know, knowing he knows the Bible very well, a Jewish person would understand that when you take from the side, it means of the same substance and also equal. So the first lesson we learn is that men and women are equal, but also same. Okay, same, and same in dignity. All right, and, and once again, in, in holiness, and, uh, but also different. And so they're, we're made of the same stuff. Men and women are equal in dignity, are the same stuff. And for Adam finally had someone of the same that was different, but also equal to him that he could what? That he could love. Same, but what's the also important word? Different. Okay? And then Genesis 1.26, we've also reviewed this is we see that then God said, let us make man our image of likeness. This means same, equal, in the capacity to love and what makes us like God. In some ways, marriage is an icon of the Blessed Trinity. Now think about this. When a man and woman normally come together in marriage through the fruit of their one flesh union, which we call, you know, uh, the marital union in a sexual, um, you know, intercourse, they produce from that what? A third person which is a child. We see that the Father and the Son love each other, and, and we see from our theology that, that, that they eternally produce what? The Holy Spirit. Now, once again, it's not, in no way are we making God sexual. Please don't misunderstand this. And we are much unlike God than we are like God, but the point is, is that marriage really teaches us, and the relationship between man and woman is the closest thing on earth we have to the image of what? Of God. We're the only creature that can love in the dimension of God. 
that we're made in a very specific way to, to love. And then Adam says, this one at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. And this one shall be called woman. From out of man this one has been taken. And this is why a man flees his father and mother and clings to his wife and two of them become one body. Do you think Adam was pretty happy? <laughs> I mean, he was, he was completely stoked about this new person in his life, his wife, right? And John Paul II makes his point. He says this, that when he says this in Scripture, that man, for the first time, manifests joy and exaltation. This is the first time he, he showed joy in Scripture. Like, now I'm complete. I have, what? A, a suitable helpmate. And he says this, before this moment, he had no reason for rejoicing owing to the lack of being like himself. But now he finally has someone to give himself to in a unique way. And in his static response, he says, at last, for now he is able to live out the law of gift and thus becomes who he was meant to be through his union with the woman. Right? And so we see that they, and they immediately, there's this one flesh human, they fall in love and this pow, there's this, this they're in love. And it's just pure love. It's a total love. It's a fruitful love. That's the and that's what marriage used to be like. And there was no shame. And there was no sin. No, no fear. None of that existed. No tension. None of that. That's what the original man was. And so Adam seems to say, look, a body that expresses the person. She reveals who I am. So he's like, okay, now I understand why my body is this way. I understand her body. We're meant for each other. And that's why homosexual unions are not appropriate. The bodies were made for one another. They're equal, but not what? Distinct. A woman can't give himself totally to a woman physically. A man can't get himself totally to a man physically. It's impossible. But a man can give himself totally to a woman because of the difference. Man and woman are made for one another. Right? It's a great, it's a big theological point that he makes there about the complementarity of man and woman. All right? You got you to really pray about this stuff because this is how we attack the culture of death is by looking at how man was supposed to be, not what we're making man now, and woman, and sexuality. Okay? All right, now, a couple other things. The two of them become one body. All right, what we're kind of jumping into here is now is, we, we talk about, we're now in the original unity, right? So it says the two will become one body. And then so, in Genesis chapter 128, it says that God gives woman and mankind his first command. Be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. What do you tell man and woman to do? To what? Come on, church. What? To procreate. Right? To procreate. To fill the earth. Now, why did God endow mankind the ability to procreate? Angels don't have this ability. Do angels cannot reproduce themselves? They're made, that's it. The, how many angels that were existed at the beginning of time, that's it. They've always existed since God made them, and that's all there will be. There's actually many more angels than humans at this point. But God made them all at once. They never what? Reproduced. Now, once again, what's, the what is, what's special about human persons? That we're the only creature made to be loved and loved by God in the image and likeness of what? Of God. We, we have this very... And so, love, love cannot exist in isolation. Right? What's one of the worst types of punishment that you can have? Solitary confinement. Right? I mean, a, a person, if they're, if they're in death row, they have, usually they'll get the electric chair or what? Solitary confinement for life. Personally, I'll take the electric chair. <laughs> I mean, it just seems like, I mean, that's essentially, it's not, it's, well, you know what it is? That's hell. That's hell on earth. To be isolated with no one to love. 
Now, a person can be alone, but they're with God. That means solitude. And that's why prayer life is so important, that you, we as Christians, we're never alone. And if you have an interior life, you're not alone. But isolation means you believe you're not loved by anyone, even God. And that's a very dangerous place for a person to be because when you're isolated, you go crazy. Because once again, the human person was made to what? To love in the manner that God loves. Right? And so, so basically they have this one flesh human. And, and so John Paul calls this the communion of persons. And, and, and I think too, let's remember, let's go back to the original solitude, the distinction between animals and humans is sex is much different from a hum for a human than it is for what? An animal. At least it should be. Amen? <laughs> it should be different because for the human person, it's not a love of just the body. It's a love of the whole what? The person. Right? What's a person? The definition of person is an and, uh, and body is a, a body and a soul. That's what makes a human person. A corpse is a body. A body and a soul together is a what? Person. You see that? And a love, like if someone's in love, they're not just loving the person's body, they're loving the whole what? Person. Do you see that? And Adam and Eve, when they, when they first, you know, had that one flesh union, they were totally in love with each other's Bodies and what? Souls. The two became one flesh. Not just the flesh, but the two persons were so united, it was perfect love. And that's why they say with humans, making love versus having sex. There's a big difference. But quite frankly, the way they use it today, it's not really making love, it's just an animalistic thing. Do you see what I mean? So all that's been twisted. There's a big difference, right? And a lot of times, you know, so... Um, all right, so some practical points. Uh, things that are getting attacked today with the one flesh union, sexual difference, equality, true love, marriage. Um, and then, you know, today, the like gender ther 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 theorists, what do they say today? That, that the uh, that sex is not something... Uh, that they say that sex is uh, something assigned at birth. Right? And it's, I mean, it, this kind of thinking is just... Bizarre, isn't it? I mean, if you, if you think about that rationally, no, your sex and your gender was given to you at conception, and it showed how you are to love another person. Right? Now, we're going to talk about why that's all twisted today when we come about historical man next class. Okay? Now, a lot of people don't experience the Adam and Eve experience today. Okay? I know this. But once again, we're going back to what man would have been like what human sexuality would have been like if Adam and Eve had never what? Sinned. Okay? So this, this first unity was just perfect. All right, now we're going to go into original nakedness, and then we'll shut it down. All right, now, look, turn with me to Genesis chapter 2, verse 25. A verse that's, you know, you, you read this, and like everyone skips over. I've never, ever heard this preached on Sunday. <laughs> and maybe that's, there's a reason for this, because it was... You know, kind of awkward because it says this Adam and Eve were quote naked and not what? What is the word you have in your Bible? Yeah. Naked and not ashamed. Alright, have you ever stopped and reflected on that? Alright, now let's talk about this. Is that well, let's talk about the word shame. Okay. Now a lot of times I think the way that sexuality is taught is Basically, it's like, all right, you don't do X, Y, and Z. Okay, that's all we're going to talk about. You can do this, you can't do that. You can't do this, you can't do that. You can't do that, you can't do that. All right, don't ask any more questions, right? And I think a lot of a lot of people, you know, if, yeah, that's. I mean, if if you got that, you, you no one ever, no one ever talked to kids or or teenagers or adults about the beauty of sexuality. It was just don't do this and don't ask any more questions. You know, I mean, it was kind of interesting in, in moral theology classes. They used to try to teach sexual ethics with oranges. You know, I mean, almost like because they didn't want the seminarians to have any sort of like, you know, and it's just it was, it was kind of bizarre. You know, they, they, 
They, and they had to hear confessions. They're like, I don't know what they're talking about. You know, <laughs> you know. I mean, so I mean, there was a sort of fear of even touching the topic, right? Because it brings a degree of when you when anytime you hear the word mentioned, what happens? You start blushing, and there's this shame and guilt. Now, I, I think the one thing is this: is we have to proclaim that that sexuality is good when it's done in the way that God designed it. It's a beautiful thing. It's 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 made in the image and of God. So we have to proclaim the fact that it is a beautiful thing. And St. Thomas Aquinas says that couples in marriage, when they have marital relations without like, you know, the way that God wants, they actually become holier. And I you know, when I tell couples that, they're like, really? <laughs> Uh, you know, it's you know, like it's just like wow. I mean, because it's it's you know, or maybe because you know, the jaded history, the history of the past. Like you know, a, a girl, you know, you know, just goes down the wrong path, or a guy, and they never really experienced true love, and it, it's been wounded, and they can't really experience that. So a lot of times, there's shame from one's history. So that word shame is really important. That God wants to heal that in the human psyche. He wants to clear that up and, and show you what human love is supposed to be. And that's what he wants a man and woman to experience in marriage. And sometimes people struggle in marriage because they carry all their baggage in marriage. And they bring it to the marriage. And then they can't see that what they're doing in their marriage is actually beautiful and holy. Do you see that? So what does it mean? Um, shame involves fear of another person. And not sure we can trust that person. We fear of being used and being hurt by a person or taken advantage of. Right? Um, so we're afraid of being vulnerable and letting others see us as we really are. Right? And so remember, Adam and Eve did not have any mistrust in each other because they never feared what? That the other person would what? Hurt them. Or what? Use them. Because they didn't have that language yet. Sin had it. They couldn't use each other. They couldn't hurt each other. They weren't capable of doing that. But we today, yes, we can. And sex becomes very manipulative and misused, and people are hurt by it, manipulated by it, wounded by it. And so we have a culture that carries a lot of what? Shame. But Adam and Eve were naked what? Without shame. So Adam and Eve were not ashamed. They had complete confidence, trust, and security in the relationship. Um, and we'll talk about this in historical man about you know why they covered themselves. Okay, let's just save that for next class. That's historical man. But their bodily nakedness pointed out an even deeper nakedness. They they that they saw they in a sense like just seeing each other's bodies was not a was not a scandal. It wasn't something dirty. It was just who they were, right? Now we're going to see in the historical man that that got flipped, okay? And that got flipped. Sexuality got wounded and flipped. Um, but they, but they saw in each other, going back that term, the nuptial meaning of the body, okay? There was what's called John Paul calls an original innocence, right? I mean, I, I mean, it's just a, I mean, it's like. You know, I got nieces and nephews, and like they're always running around the house, and they, other, and they have no idea what they're doing without their clothes on. You know, and my sister, go go grab her. You know, go put some. You know, they have no idea because they're what, what about kids? They're what? They're innocent. Adam and Eve were like that. They were once again naked without shame. Now, look, don't. What I'm saying is, this doesn't mean people go out and just they're naked without shame today. But please don't do that. I, but the, the point of the matter is, <laughs> right? I mean, we'll explain like why modesty is necessary today. We, we're not in heaven yet, right? Okay, we're not there yet. Okay, we're, we're a historical man. But I'm just saying how it used to be, right? How it used to be. All right, and so they were in this ideal relationship. So imagine, imagine this. Let's go back to the beginning. Imagine living in a relationship, a marriage, where there was absolutely no selfishness. I mean, let's, I mean that's essentially what we're talking about. Not just with just sexuality, but just in general. There was a total giving. The man gave himself, not just in every way, and the woman back, and with no selfishness. That's what we're looking at. It's, it was pure, authentic what? Gift and reception of the gift. 
love, giving, and being loved. There was no selfishness. They knew that their beloved was always seeking what was best for them. And remember, what does St. Thomas say that love is? Doing what's best for what? The other. And that's what marriage used to be like. And, and think about it in your own marriages. You're, mo you're most connected with your spouse when you're focused on the needs of the what? Of the other. Not just physically, but what? Emotionally and spiritually too. So in his first marriage, Adam was so in sync with her emotions and thoughts and feelings and everything. She never felt alone and neither did he. They were in this beautiful communion of persons. And they viewed each other as a gift that was uniquely trusted and took uh, this role seriously with, with uh, great responsibility. Uh, and now the other thing too is like what we're seeing also in Adam and Eve is they had what's called perfect self-mastery. Okay, perfect self-mastery. Now, one of the we'll talk about this next class a little bit more is one of the effects of concupiscence of the sin is that the passions, our passions are not are 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 many times overtake the intellect. Adam had perfect self-mastery where he was his passions never were out of control. He was always in control, right? Now, as human persons, now we struggle. We have to fight and need grace to be what? In control. And it's one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit, right? So we need God now to do this. And the good news is, with God, we can get like that again with God's grace. But in the beginning, there was no struggle with the passions. And they had a total purity of heart, which they... They were free from selfish desires and approached each other with great reverence, seeking the good of the other and never viewing the other as an object to be used. Okay? Do you see that? So that's what the naked without shame means. Okay? So there was never this sort of like, whoa, what's going on? And next class we're talking about what happened and how did that get tweaked and why we as human persons today find it very hard to do that. Okay? We'll talk about this. But once again, we're looking at Jesus said, in the beginning, it was not so. Right? All right. Now, John Paul II, in, in, uh, in one of his, in his conferences on original nakedness, he said that Adam and Eve saw each other with a supernatural perspective with the vision of the Creator. Uh, it was interesting. Uh, a, a priest that I'm friends with, he was given a conference on, uh, on charity, on love. You know, not just, I mean, just on being charitable. And, you know, like sometimes when you see a person, like, you'll like size them up and you know, already got them all figured out. You haven't even met the person. You've already judged them like three times. You know, and you, you've got them all figured out, right? Because they walk funny. Okay, and, and as human persons, we, we struggle with malice and all kinds of weird things. But he said, he, he told us his priest, he says, say this prayer, Jesus, may I see people with your eyes. I was really struck by that. May I see others as you see them? I want you to focus on that. And that's a supernatural for a second. Seeing people as God sees them. Adam and Eve saw each other in the way God saw them. Not the way they, they weren't broken. Their eyes weren't broken. They weren't tainted. They just saw the beauty of the other person. And what are the things, what's the, what's the one thing that, that can converts a person more than anything? Beauty and truth, right? Like beautiful liturgy, a beautiful mass can really move the heart. Why? We're made for beauty. Adam and Eve, they didn't see any ugliness in each other. They only saw what? God in that other person. They saw the image and likeness of God in that other person. And now, now we, we have, we, our eyes are not like that. Okay? They're not like that. But they, they will become more like that the more we become like who? Like Christ. In other words, they saw each other as the way that God himself saw them. Adam saw not just the beauty of Eve's body, but the whole truth of his beloved as a person. And just as God rejoiced and created man and woman by saying, it is good, so Adam would have looked upon his wife with a profound sense of awe and wonder, seeing her as the daughter of God who had trusted herself to him in marriage. So as God saw Eve and said, it is good, when he saw his wife, he said, what? She is good. And all he said, and she saw it back in him. 
John Paul II says, seeing each other as if through the mystery of creation, man and woman see each other, other even more fully and distinctly through the sense of sight itself. They see and know each other with all peace of the interior gaze, which creates precisely the fullness of the intimacy of persons. So they didn't see a body part or body parts. They saw what? A person. Do you see that? They weren't able to objectify. They only saw the whole package. Now, this is interesting. Uh, this one uh, uh, commentator talked about pornography. And he, he listen to this statement. This is really deep. All right? He says, consider the following statement. The problem with pornography isn't that it shows too much. The problem with pornography is it doesn't show enough. Do you understand what he means by that? Or you don't understand what he means? Okay, what he means is pornography is based on just parts of the person. It's not showing what? The whole person. That's the damning thing about it. It doesn't show what? enough because the person becomes objectified and used and not what loved and cherished right that's much deeper than say don't look at pornography <laughs> right you see they see the vision that god has for for human sexuality is that the human person must not be used but is to be loved and revered and every human person knows that deep down every human person does want to love that way and I think innately knows they were made that way. Now how we how a person gets that way, we'll get to that when we get to eschatological man. And it's tied in with the sacraments. Okay, and it goes in short by obsessing on the body, we ignore the ultimately we ultimately dishonor the personhood of the other. The experience of shame helps us guard against the exploitation of our body. So what we're going to talk about next time is historical man. We're going to talk about the fall, the effects of it, but then how does Jesus give us a remedy out of it? All right? So let's, let's end there. Did that make sense to some degree? Okay. Um, like I said, it's an introduction. It's not, there's, there's so much to this. I will, I will uh, send you out some books. And, uh, there's one book I've been using. It's called Theology the Body in an Hour. I doubt it's going to take you only an hour to read it. It's by Jason Everett. It's a good synopsis of it. Um, I also, I forgot... Um, uh, someone brought, uh, Mary brought some CDs, which I'll bring next class, which you can listen online uh, from another perspective. And uh, but it's, it's once again, we're just trying to we're trying to unpack and dis and also dislodge some of the lies that have been said about the body. Now, one thing I want to uh, point out is, and this is another concept of John Paul II, is that just like we can speak truth with our mouths and we can lie with our mouths, we can also speak truth and lie with our body. Right? So it's a lot of times we have to talk about it. It's the sense that you can speak lies with your body. Right? It's not just with the mouth, but with the body. And we're talking about truth of the body, and what we're trying to unpack is what's the truth about the body, and what are the lies that the evil ones are planting in people about the body. Okay? So that's stage one of theology of the body. Okay? Let's say a glory be to the Father, and then uh, we have adoration upstairs. We want to do some prayer. And uh, in about one hour, a little bit less than one hour, we'll have compline and then benediction, okay? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end, amen. And may God bless you all, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit.